Hello, everyone, and welcome to Knights of the Pageless Library. I am Bo Knight, joined as always by my brother Ryan Knight, and today we have an extra special guest for you, Andrew Scott. Andrew Scott, how are you doing today? I am doing well, Bo. How are you guys? Oh, we're doing pretty good. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. Excellent. So, Andrew, you run Andrew Scott Media, correct? That is correct, amongst, uh, frankly, many other hats that I have to wear, <laughs> but that that is the primary one, yeah. All right, right on. And I, uh, the way we got this kind of set up is that I kind of reached out to see if uh, anybody wanted to be a guest on our little tiny podcast over here, and you graciously responded to us to be on here, so we really do appreciate that. Uh, I'm more than happy to, and I uh, appreciate getting a chance to talk to you guys. Right on. We... Uh, so for anybody who's followed us for any length of time, normally we do audiobook reviews and things like that. And we also talk about anime and stuff as well as video games on our podcast. And one common denominator for us that ties all of those together is narration and voiceover work. And so when you reached out to me, I was very excited because potentially who better to talk to in the voiceover industry than you? Well, you are selling past the clothes for me, man. <laughs> that, that's that's big praise, and I appreciate it very much. Well, right on. So, Andrew, why don't you uh, give our listeners just a little idea of what you do and maybe how long you've been doing it? Yeah, the, we'll try to give you the uh, the five second uh, the how shall I say it the five second origin story. <laughs> uh, I uh, I've been involved with media my whole life. Uh, I was born in 1968. One of my first memories uh, uh, that I still think I have is uh, Apollo 13, oddly enough, uh, when I was a tiny little tot. <laughs> but um, my dad uh, worked for a very, very large uh, manufacturing company with a footprint in the uh, automotive and industrial manufacturing. And uh, he was really, for the time, he was very cutting edge and he would bring home all manner of tape recorders, video tape recorders, when they had them and computers, which was a really big thing for me when I was young. Um, but at the same time, I also got very uh, fascinated by the, by the sound of the announcer guy on television. <laughs> and I would, um, I, you know, other kids my age wanted to be astronauts or race car drivers or firemen. I wanted to be the announcer which was really odd for a five-year-old kid. <laughs> um, and to cut a extraordinarily long story short that if people are interested in hearing it, they can hear it in my, uh, the book that I wrote a couple of years ago. Um, but really um, narration and voice acting uh, was a natural outgrowth of me as a teenager being in rock and roll bands and wanting to be a rock god um, because... <laughs> You know, all of us were working at Subway or something like that at the time. We couldn't afford sure. real studio time. So um, when the technology started coming online for us to be able to do generally high quality recordings at home with a four track cassette deck or something of that nature, um, we immediately rushed down into our parents' disused basements, cleaned out the cobwebs and tried to build audio recording studios nice. and yeah, well, you know, you got to start somewhere and right. the basement was it literally. <laughs> and, um, you know, really from there, a lot of times we were obviously trying to make music, but there were a lot of times when there was no music happening or we were waiting on bandmates or something like that. And we would fall into trying to mimic radio spots and call-in shows and commercials uh, just for practice something sonic to do sure and uh my primary songwriting partner stayed with music and i went into broadcasting and i did a little bit of time as a board op uh you would think i would immediately think of becoming a dj and i did and i did a little bit of that i was actually much uh, more successful as a club dj uh, when the advent of uh, EDM, electronic music, acid house, things like that started happening. Okay. Did that work for a while, but um, then I took a hard left turn, went to college, got a philosophy degree, which makes me immensely employable, <laughs> um, and uh, I came back to it. I came out, I was in the Midwest at the time I was born uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 
Uh, and uh, right at the turn of the millennium, I came out to the West Coast. I had started, I had learned HTML uh, back when uh, that was a thing and uh, started a web development company and was a web developer for many years. That brought me out to the West Coast uh, to work for a ginormous uh, international bank uh, for a year and a half before the ulcer that it gave me. Uh, in the corporate world, um, <laughs> told me, you know, this probably ain't the jam for you. Sure. And uh, I did a bunch of other things, uh, but I always had this nagging thing in my head. I really want to try the voiceover thing. I mean, for real. I did a few spots back in the day. I, I was literally, you guys will chuckle at this. I was literally the guy that went, Sunday, 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 Great Lakes, Dragaway, Union Grove, Wisconsin. You have to buy a whole seat, but you'll only need the edge. <laughs> nice. And I, I was that guy for a little bit, but it, 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 it stuck in my head. And really the, the main problem at the millennium was that computers just, computers could do the audio, but hard drives didn't spin fast enough for us to record that with any kind of useful fidelity that would apply to the professional audio and broadcast world. And that all changed right around 2005 when we got 7,200 RPM discs. And a lot of very big names in voiceover at that time suddenly realized, oh, I don't gotta go to the studio. They would run an ISDN line to their house. And the, really the most notable person in this realm that everybody would know, even if not by name, is a guy named Don LaFontaine. And Don LaFontaine was in a world where that that's okay. Don LaFontaine. <laughs> okay. If it was a Paramount picture, right. he was doing the trailer, right? Sure. Don realized he, I mean, he was filthy rich by then because he was the guy. Um, he was like, I don't want to go to some studio anymore. So he ran a high speed digital line to his house back then. It was ISDN and, um, for the rest of his life made millions and millions of dollars working in his basement before he patted his editor on the shoulder as he walked out to the golf course, right, right outside his house. <laughs> and that was really the, that was really the the mark, the point when home VO work became not only doable, but practical and profitable. And right around 2014, I was working a telemarketing job and I got fired for the first time in my life. And, you know, I was in my mid forties, I'm a disabled guy. So there's that to take into consideration. Didn't have a whole lot of prospects. And I was like, you know, if not now, when I didn't really have a decent mic, I, I had a broken MacBook. uh, the keyboard didn't work and the mouse didn't work. So I had to use external everything hmm. and, uh, took my severance pay from that job that they bounced me from, went out and bought a used blue snowball microphone and uh recorded my first spot and made my first 250 dollars doing a a uh psa for one of the largest governmental agencies in the united states oh, and wow. i was on my way interestingly my very next job was an audiobook for one of the most noted not profit organizations in the united states and earned my first thousand dollars while at the same time making such a mess of that process, because I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I had no idea what I'd gotten myself into. And really, this was me getting paid a thousand dollars to apologize to this nonprofit for about the next nine months, because <laughs> I was so underwater and so far behind on it. <laughs> but that's really kind of me and where I started. And really now what I do is I am an author. I wrote a book on how to get into this business called the quick and dirty guide to the home voiceover industry. Um, I am a voiceover coach. I coach people who want to do this. I run a discord server. 
uh, and I am also a YouTuber, uh, and I run a channel on YouTube called The VO Booth Camp, and uh, yeah, help people take a stab at doing this for fun and profit. Nice, and I really appreciate the name, The VO Booth Camp. I do, I think that's great. <laughs> that's pretty good. I would love to say that I am wholly and totally unique in that, but there are about four different versions of that. <laughs> so I have to state it now like I am the Ohio State University. <laughs> I, I had to throw the the on the front of it to differentiate sure. myself, but I'm glad you like it. Thanks. Yeah. And then um, I've watched quite a few of those videos and I do like that you go into some, you know, very simple ways for people who think that maybe the industry you have to have the most high tech equipment or the most sound deadened room in anybody's house. Like I like that you, you've kind of taken that barrier of entry and definitely made it more accessible to everyone to, to show everyone you don't have to have the most expensive thing to get into the business. Yeah, no, you got to start somewhere. And to think that I like started with a Neumann U87 microphone that literally costs as much as my first three cars combined. <laughs> um, no, you don't. Wow. And yeah, it's, it's important to me to be able to meet people where they are and give them something valuable for it, you know, sure. for the time. What would you say if you, <clears throat> if, if somebody was wanting to get started, like, you know, the very first thing they were going to do, what would you say would be some essentials they need to focus on to even get started? Yeah, that's the magic question. And um, really what you need to do first is research. And I think that that's a missing piece of this process for a lot of people. Like you said, they immediately think, oh, I need a mic. I got to figure out a way to make a quiet space. That, all that stuff comes later. Uh, the first thing to do is to really try to get an understanding about what this industry, this, this narration, audiobook production, and commercial voiceover industry is about. Because, number one, it's changed from the classic idea of what it was when I was a kid growing up. You know, it's not some dude standing in a in a big studio with his hand over one ear, like Gary Owens <laughs> from, you know, laughing. Um, it's very different now and it has different requirements and it honestly, it actually has more room for more people than it once did back in the day. You needed to know a guy, you sure. know, you, you needed to kind of be in that ecosphere and now the, there are many, many more opportunities than there used to be at all different levels of the production game. But what people really need to understand is this is not an easy industry. It's not an easy job. And it's vastly more complicated than most people would like it to be. Um, also, you need to be really, really, really good at accepting rejection. Sure. Uh, most, most people where I am, and uh, for your listeners, I'm what I would refer to as a mid-level talent and a mid-level producer. I do do national work, and I'm, it's kind of odd when I say national work because that really doesn't mean anything anymore. Everything is international <laughs> and exists for all times now. So, right. But, um, you know, I do work for Fortune 500 companies here in the United States. I do uh, work for giant companies all around the world. I have clients in uh, Dubai and, and the Emirates, uh, South Korea, uh, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. Um, uh, the Philippines, uh, all over the place, but, um, you can do what people would consider to be high level work at, at a lower tier. And at the same time, really my batting average, which I think is generally representative of most people in this industry, my batting average is around 98 percent wow. and no see what i'm saying is 
98 times out of 100, I get rejected. I, okay, oh, okay, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love for it to be the other way, but I don't have the time of day to work that much. Um, it's an extraordinarily high rejection rate in this industry. You are, you are essentially a professional receiver of rejection and no feedback. And well, that's, that's, I think that's extremely good information to give people though, that if you are not willing to accept rejection, maybe that's not something to even look into. That's a, exactly why I say it because. Uh, a lot of times, and actually a good way to explain this is in, in my book, um, I start off by telling people that the book that I was writing was not a how-to book. It was a should I book. Because there are so many things like that, so many facets of this industry that people are unaware of or unprepared for that I felt it was incumbent upon me to make sure that people knew, because honestly, that's, those kinds of things are really rude surprises. You know, I mean, if you sure. show up for work one day, knowing that 98 times out of a hundred, you were going to be judged as a failure or not good enough. If you don't have the particular temperament to be able to process that and not have it affect you personally, you are going to be one miserable, miserable person. And I don't want that for people. Sure. No, that's, that's very good info. And I know one of the things that we found surprising, one of the narrators we spoke to on here brought to our attention that even though as far as on audible goes, he's considered a popular and even potentially, you know, a book selling narrator, Mm -hmm. He only gets paid his initial upfront cost for his narration. No royalties, yeah. no nothing on top. And I was actually kind of shocked by that. I yeah. did not know that. Mm -hmm. It depends on the contract. It depends on the publishing house. If there is a publishing house, right. it depends on the author. Uh, to say there are very, to say that there are many moving parts is an understatement. Um, but generally speaking, that is one of the changes that has happened over the last couple decades. We don't often as producers and voiceover talents, generally speaking, are producers as well. Um, yeah, we don't make residuals. We don't make royalties. Um, and actually there's a bit of a pitched battle going on in the industry these days about whether or not royalties and residuals are actually a good thing. A lot of times, if you get on a casting site, um, smaller underfunded authors and publishers will try to get you to take royalty pay royalty share is what it's called versus an upfront cost. Oh, okay. now, that sounds interesting. That sounds like, oh, continuing income. Wow. Yeah. You know, do it once and get paid for the rest of the lifetime of this thing. Well, that's fabulous if you're doing something by John Grisham. Right. Yeah. But if you're doing something by Janie Grisham, whom nobody's <laughs> ever heard before, um, literally sometimes I have a couple students who did agree to royalty pay. And in five years, earned less than $10. Oh, wow. Oof. And you're talking about earning $10 for something that generally speaking takes for a 10 hour audiobook, you could very easily conceive of somebody working a hundred hours on that project. Wow. Sure. So a hundred dollars, 10 bucks, you are literally making fractions of pennies sure yeah so that, get yeah getting get it getting paid up front that's kind of what us producers like best sure. we like to be able to keep our lights on and pay for our our fancy microphones yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely a lot less of a gamble it sounds like it definitely and that's exactly the way to look at it it's hedging your bets on success of somebody whom you've never heard and nobody's ever heard before either versus i'll do your work and I'll do a great job. And then the success part is up to you and your marketing scheme. Sure. You know? Yeah. That is an interesting aspect of it that I didn't, that I think the, where the, um, this particular narrator was 
concerned is that he has been told that, you know, that when people see his name on there, that he is selling books because he is a, you know, he has that good book selling voice, I guess. Right. And so for him to hear that and then to realize these books are flying off the shelf per se because of his voice, yet he is apparently though, you know, he must have just maybe he should make sure he puts that in his contract in the future, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And there's always room for that too. And a, a lot of, a lot of well-placed narrators, the ones that do the big, I mean, look, nobody is reaching out on Reddit to find somebody to narrate a Stephen King book. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. Steve, Stephen <laughs> King's people. Well, number one, Stephen King has people sure. and, and, and those people, are plugged into other people and those kinds of jobs don't don't trickle down into the realm of where i would safely say the vast majority of voice talent are sure those things are done by uh by um i would say well-represented people with a number of agents and generally they're probably sag aftra you know they're union represented so they're getting union scale and union pay for their work. The vast majority of audiobook work these days is done by non-union talent. And sure. I'm not currently in SAG-AFTRA. I'm, I'm an independent producer. So, um, yeah, you know, if you were in those tiers, that's just it. You would get a per hour. You would get what the union refers to as a day rate. Um, you certainly wouldn't be uh, editing the audiobook yourself. You would just be the guy that was reading the words and making the voices. Right. And yeah. so you can make a different, you can, you can establish a different payout that way. Um, and you know, whether or not you are the voice that moves books, um, the, the good news is there are more books than there are voices to move them. <laughs> right. Okay. So there's a little bit of trickle down for everybody. Sure. Absolutely. What, um, has most of your work been in would you say it's in the audiobook, you know, area or, um, like I said, you know, we enjoy cartoons and video games and things like that, where all of that stuff is brought to life with voiceover work. So do, do you know, I guess, even have most of your students gone into one area or another? Most of my students, um, generally speaking, focus themselves into the into a niche this is a very niche business and there are many people in it who are adept at more than one thing uh but it it's often an admonition of mine to not try to stick too many body parts in too many niches when you're starting out you will get drawn and quartered by uh the mm -hmm. vo industry very quickly <laughs> um, it, it, it's just keeping too many plates in the air and it's very hard to get good at numerous things at the same time. So I generally tell people, focus on one thing, do that, get that in place, and then you can build from there. But I do have people, uh, all over the spectrum as far as, uh, we've got some of them who do ADR and what's called looping, uh, for animation work where, they will literally a loop is when they'll play the video over and over and over again uh, in in for one particular passage of a piece of dialogue. And it is the voice talents job to try to match the lips of the animation as best as possible. And they'll they'll do take after take after oh, take wow. until they get just the right one. That's called looping. Um, ADR is also a kind of looping that stands for automated dialogue replacement. And ADR happens very often when you're getting an anime product from Japan translated into English. Okay. Uh, so people like Crunchyroll and Funimation, they do lots of ADR. Sure. Um, but I also have people who do audiobooks. They do fiction. They do nonfiction. Some of them specialize in things like medical narration. Some oh, wow. uh, do things like online e-learning, which, of course, for the last couple of years, thanks, pandemic, uh, has <laughs> been a, a really big thing. And interestingly, um, yeah, my business blew up over the pandemic uh, because so many things shifted to online online yeah. learning and how many other people have been 
you know, whiling lockdown away by watching things on YouTube. Uh, and I do a lot of work on YouTube outside of my own YouTube product. I do, I'm a voice of a one point, I think it's, I think we're up to 1.4 million, uh, subscriber, uh, channel that focuses on, um, fighting arts, sports, MMA, boxing, oh, a, little interesting. Bit of baseball, a little bit of basketball, a little bit of football. And I get to be the really intense guy for that, you know, cause <laughs> I'm talking about some dude getting beaten in the face repeatedly and the crowd erupts kind of thing. Nice. Um, but the, the pandemic taught us a couple other interesting things about voiceover. And uh, what, what it really showed is that us people who are deep down in the voiceover business, we were born for this pandemic lockdown right. thing. <laughs> we, we, we already spend all our time in tiny little rooms and we don't <laughs> see anybody. So um, we were all, we already had our Zoom muscle in place because that's how we dialed into other studios. And this was a cakewalk for us. Nice. Um, but um, yeah, all over the spectrum. And one of the things I think that that brings up that's interesting is people don't realize just how prevalent voiceover work and voice acting is in day to day life. It's almost kind of invisible, but the amount of people coming in are often surprised by, oh, yeah, I guess that does take voice. Um, I make I've made and still do make a pretty decent, uh, comfortable living being the voice of the guy on an automated phone system. Oh, really? Yeah. I've, I've wondered about that before. <laughs> of like, like, how much should somebody get paid to do this? <laughs> well, you know, if you're talking about some mom and pop shop, you're not going to get a lot. But if you're talking about something like a hospital attached to a university, mm -hmm. which uh, necessitates uh, something called an IVR system or innovative, Inter integral. I talk for a living, by the way. Uh, <laughs> You're killing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm killing something. That's for sure. Uh, IVR is integrated voice response, uh, where it's you know press one now for mm -hmm. this option. Um, you know that can be thousands of dollars, and not only that. Quite often, if there's a lot of churn in that industry, if a lot of people come and go, um, they'll often contract and keep on contract the voice talent because. They don't want, you know, the first voice to be, and now you'll be speaking with John Smith. And then all of a sudden this guy goes away and they got to fill in a new person. Right. So, you know, they punch in some guy's voice like this and it sounds like, you know, <laughs> I'll have Jerry get back to you in a minute. Okay, hold on. <laughs> um, so there, there's plenty of money to be made in those things. It's just a lot of people don't know those things are actually things. And then when you get into the realm of, audiobook work one of the other things that the pandemic gave us is a whole slew of new authors because mm -hmm, people right. were just yeah. sitting around going well i guess it's time for me to finally write that great american novel <laughs> um and so much of the mid to low tiers of of audiobook work is working for independent authors some would say uh on things that would be referred to as vanity projects. I just did a little air quote thing for your listeners. Um, but, you know, they don't have the budget. They don't have the thousands of dollars that it would normally cost to do a Grishamy type level book, but they still want it. And they probably sound like this, even though their characters, I don't know, some eight foot dude with a sword. So they need to cast a net and find somebody to do that. And again, a lot of people will do work and they'll make 500, 600 bucks on an audiobook. And a year later, they could be doing the same length of audiobook, but suddenly they're making 800 to a thousand dollars. It's really just a matter of what you're able to say you've done over the past and show people that you have some value, whether or not you're going to be that voice that moves books. Sure. At the end of the day, what's most important is that you're the voice that the author feels suits their material best and brings it to life. Yeah. Yeah. That's an, that's a good point too. We were surprised to ask one of our guests. He had also done some acting and some other things like that. And we asked him what his kind of favorite, form of 
expression was and we asked if audiobooks was one that he really enjoyed and he actually even though he's really really good at it he kind of was like uh no not really yeah <laughs> <laughs> he was very honest with you and i'm gonna give you pretty much the same thing i uh i did a lot of work uh when i was younger i was stage trained and uh performed in opera light opera choral work i was in rock and roll bands for many years i did some stage acting and yeah, I'm not really big on audiobooks really? Uh, as far as my own entertainment goes or or as far as what I feel demonstrates my voice and my narration abilities the best. What I really enjoy doing is things like um, science education videos. Okay. I am I am I am a deep and abiding nerd and um, I, I was just able to I I uh, began a business uh, relationship with a content creator down in New Zealand who has started up a YouTube channel about uh, science and technology. And as a lifelong space nerd, uh, I was thrilled to be able to, as our first project together, to do a 40-some minute walkthrough uh, about the uh, NASA Artemis program and the SLS and, uh, and rockets, man. Uh, yeah. that's really, that's, that's the kind of stuff that I love doing. I love learning and I love helping people learn what they want to learn and understand what they want to understand. Nice. Yeah. And it's good for people like me because audio format is much easier for me. I'm not a very good reader. I'm a very slow reader. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've always been drawn to audio, audio book format on anything really whether that comes to learning books or just entertainment books oh yeah and uh you know i think you you bring up a good point that um i think is often overlooked and uh again this is just really quick uh i am disabled uh back when i was 15 years old in 1983 i had an accident i had a diving accident and i broke my neck oh, wow. and uh i was you know long story short i'm still here um, I still have some residual paralysis and things like that, but as a result of that, I am a huge advocate for accessibility for people in all ways, shapes, and forms. And accessibility also brings with it the accessibility of information to people like those with uh, vision impairments or learning difficulties sure. and i mean gosh i can only think of what my educational life would have been like if i had access to audiobooks versus textbooks because yeah. i'm 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 like you man i'll absorb it if i hear it if i gotta read it it just turns into spilled alphabet soup and i will retain virtually nothing yeah absolutely um, and so to be able to be part of that for people and bring them the the, the entry point to understanding, massively powerful for me, and it makes my day worthwhile. Nice. <clears throat> what, um, go ahead, Bill. I, I don't want to steer the conversation too much, but you mentioned something before we started recording that, that I found really interesting was this like AI generated narration that like Apple oh. is doing. We're kicking that anthill now? I, okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like if you're on here, it would be a much better conversation than if me and Ryan just had it. And, and somebody on the inside who knows a lot more about all the, all that goes into like the production behind all that. So what's your take on this? I'm going to be as diplomatic as possible here. Um, part of me is quaking in my boots. And uh, interestingly, like we were talking about before we started the interview, um, I'm in the middle of uh, editing a two-part video on this very topic. Um, the first video, and then, like I say, I'm sure you guys will be able to include links to it. I'll send them to you. Uh, the first video was me sitting here at my desk eating a bowl of granola while my voice or what appeared to be my voice was talking about whether or not artificial intelligence and AI voices would ever replace a human narrator. Now the tweak on that idea was that it was my voice as generated a year and a half ago 
by a new AI platform that could synthesize me saying anything I typed into it after I spent all of 10 minutes reading a bunch of nonsense into it. Oh, wow. And what's, what's really, what really freaked me out is I did that voice a year and a half ago, maybe. And when I first heard it played back to me, I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty Swiss cheese to me. But when I started researching this videos, these videos that I'm doing, I went back to it because I was like, hey, I wonder if I still have access to that system and be able to use that AI voice. And I played the exact same thing that I typed into it before. And it sounded a whole lot better than it did at first. And that means that AI for the last year and a half was getting better at my voice. It was learning without me being there. And I'm not exaggerating. That put a shiver down my spine. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, there are a bunch of fun things in that video. I'm literally sitting here on camera wearing a Skynet shirt. <laughs> um, but uh, the other side of that video is that the first two thirds of that video, when I'm talking about will AI ever replace human narrators, and it's a list of reasons why it never will. That was written by a chat bot. I oh, literally okay. just, I literally just typed in, will AI synthesized voices ever replace human narrators? And give that to me in 750 words. And within five seconds, the page populated with a script. And that is cause for concern. And to fast forward into the here and now with this, I don't know if your listeners have known, but um, two of the most major stories in the last literally only two weeks, both Audible and Apple have very quietly rolled out offerings on their platforms where they are audiobooks narrated by synthesized AI voices. Wow. No, no fanfare. They didn't make it known that they were going to do this. And would you like to be a beta listener or anything like that? They just threw them out there and they're seeing what the market thinks of it. Not only that though, they're seeing, in my opinion, they're seeing what the market will tolerate. Sure. Because to, to be honest, you know, a Apple might be a good company, Audible, however you want to think of them. Uh, they're companies. And companies like making money. Companies like making money a lot more than they like spending money. And to be perfectly honest, us ugly bags of mostly water narrators, um, we're expensive. And we have concerns like being able to go to the bathroom or taking an hour because our brains are melting and our ears are fried. And no, your project's not ready yet. It'll be ready tomorrow because I have a cold today and you probably don't want me recording. So... There is a vested interest in large platforms, and I'll include things like, um, like, uh, uh, brain freeze. Oh, I'll include things like Spotify, mm -hmm. um, you know, and most of the major online streaming platforms, they have a vested interest in keeping their profits high and their expenses low. And in that equation, where is the most flexible expense? It is the narrator and it is going to impact our industry. It already is impacting our industry. That's why I'm trying to get people to understand this isn't a future thing. This is a now thing. This is happening now. And are they at a place where they're as good as the human voice? No, not even the one that was made literally from my own voice is as good as I am. But if you know anything about Moore's law, where technology advances every two years, it doubles. Mm -hmm. My personal and professional opinion is we're at a point where five years from now, AI voices will be indistinguishable from human voices. And we uh, won't be, we won't be needed anymore. Yeah. Uh.
You, you will literally be able to program in the emotion and the tone and the inflection and the meter and even things like uh, in, in speech pathology, we have something called a disfluence, which is when you're saying, uh, I, I'd like to st that little stutter at mm -hmm. the beginning of a word, that's a disfluence and disfluences are what sell the illusion of immersion in a story. That's what takes a good narrator and separates it from a great narrator. A great narrator has that ability to draw you in and make the rest of the world disappear. And AI voices are going to be able to do that very soon. Uh, that's kind of stressful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how is the play? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it's not even necessarily, obviously, as stressful to us from a... Uh, <laughs> business standpoint because right now obviously we don't necessarily <clears throat> benefit from being a narrator but i also don't necessarily know how good i feel about the idea of listening to a book read by the computer right especially read, if read by an algorithm right and especially if like you're saying it gets to the point where i have a hard time distinguishing whether or not it's a real person that's disconcerting to me well and not only that where how do you feel about not even having the option or the knowledge that that's what's happening right yeah that was going to be my next question you if you thought you know say a platform like audible starts rolling these out well they got to put something under the narrator are they just going to have random made up names right for these things and now i'm going to Start yeah. telling my audience, hey, John Doe is one of my new favorite up and coming narrators. Yeah. Yeah. Come exactly. to find out that's it's not even a person that we're not even celebrating or acknowledging a person. We're acknowledging a program. Right. And, you know, I don't want to come off and I know I am to some degree or another coming off rather tinfoil hatty about this. But uh. OK, you know what? I thank you for your little noise of no you're probably doing okay yeah, with this that's, that's that's how i feel I don't, I don't feel like you're being conspiracy theory here i am i i and i've my whole life i've been a keen observer of the interplay between technology and culture and you know to to go to that touchstone of western culture which is of course jurassic park um, that great line that Jeff Goldblum delivers, you were so busy thinking, well, we can do this now. You didn't bother to stop and think about whether or not you should. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we are at, uh, an inflection point where, because again, a lot of these companies aren't even telling you that this is going on. And again, not in a conspiracy way, every company's got to protect their trade secrets. But I have a problem when us, you know, meat bags are not even given the information of knowing whether or not this is happening. Um, that, that I find disturbing because then you start getting into the idea of, well, what's art, what's culture? What's our responsibility as people who consume media? What is our, you know, where, where are the guardrails for this? Um, and again, it's this, this rapid acceleration of technology. It is great and everything. You know, we have electric cars now, but, you know, even there, we got electric cars that drive themselves sometimes into people. Yeah. I mean, and some, yeah, sometimes not very well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, if you were aiming for that person, you nailed it. <laughs> but it's it's really when it comes to art, and I mean, now art, good Lord, we've got uh, chatbots and programs where you can literally go in, and I've been messing around with this in my own research, where you can just type in, I'd like to see a picture of me standing on top of the Eiffel Tower while fighting King Kong. And blap, it comes out, and it's photorealistic. Wow. It is mental yeah and we are really in my mind we're only a few 
months away from somebody like me being able to take uh, an audio uh, an audiobook chapter that I've recorded in the raw and feed it into a computer and say, edit this for pacing, remove all the breaths, make sure that it is compressed down to two to one, um, that it has a DS on it, and these are all terms for audio engineering, and make sure that it passes audible QA standards. So now my editing skills that I charge for, they're going away. Sure. My voice is at question, and my market is shrinking rapidly. And so what I'm telling people right now is, um, you know, diversify your offerings as a content producer, because this is going to, this isn't going to be a sea change. This is going to be a tsunami. And what I really encourage your listeners to take into consideration is whether or not you're willing to stand up against the machine and say, you know, I'd actually really rather have a meat bag do this. I'd really rather have a person do this. I'd like to know that somebody made a decent living telling me this story and interpreting this story for me and giving me this world to immerse myself in. Not simply because somebody with a mouse in their hand said, make this part scarier and yeah. magically it happens. Right. So yeah, we're in a, we're in a pretty, we're in a pretty interesting place and I'd love to be able to prognosticate and say either A or B will happen. I don't know that, but I do know that something's going to happen and it's going to be happening probably within the next four or five years. Yeah, absolutely. And we would we definitely encourage people as well to speak with your hard earned money. But uh, like you brought up, the issue will be is if we are even made privy to that fact when, yeah. from the final product. If I don't know that this product was made by an AI, if it gets to be that good, you know, I I could support it whether or not I even knew. So, And there's the other question of will you care as a consumer, as sure. a financial consumer paying for a product or just a consumer of the content? Are you going to care? I mean, there's plenty of stuff that I don't care about being technologically uh, advantageous. You know, I've got one of these, you know, and I just had to hit the button in case I say her name and she'll wake up. I've got an Amazon Alexa on my desk right. and all my lights in my studio. I literally come in here and say, Alexa, shoot a video and all the wrong lights go off and all the right lights go on and my camera flips on and Boom, it's magic. It's fabulous. That's obviously where I draw the line. I go, that's acceptable use of technology. Right. But I've actively consented to that thing sitting on my desk. Yeah. Right. If, if I'm not told that something is AI generated, where's, where's, where, and you're, and you're foisting it out to the public saying, Here's something for you to consume. And the average person would assume that it's real. Isn't that, isn't there an ethical rub there that happens if you don't tell them that it's not right. And as the, as the, as a guy with a philosophy degree, <laughs> I think that, I think that, that this is like the only time it ever comes in handy. Right. <laughs> um, I, I have, I don't, I don't want to say I have a problem. I have concerns about that that have not been fully explored and answered yet by the companies that are doing it. Yeah. This, this next thing I wanted to ask you about kind of plays into that a little bit because if things are also moving, if they're not already as rapidly moving towards AI as you're saying, this blurb that, um, you know, the author Brandon Sanderson? Yes, I do. Okay, so he recently made a very bold statement that his new books would not be released to Audible mm -hmm. because apparently the industry standard for most digital productions for the audio portion pay about the creator 70%. The distribution company keeps roughly 30% as far as he's putting it. Right. He says Audible will put, they will give the creator... 40%, they will keep 60%. If right. you choose not to have your 
content solely distributed by Audible with that nice little yellow stripe, Audible exclusive, they will only give you 25% of all the earnings to the creator, and then they yeah. will keep 75. So now it's very obviously looking like they are even working towards squeezing people to the point of you either exclusively sign with us, make this stuff ours, or guess what? We're well on our way to just taking your content. We'll throw an AI over the top of it and we'll release it anyways. Yeah. I mean, and at some point, every culture looks back at an inflection point and goes, you know, we really weren't paying attention. <laughs> and yeah, that's that everything that that he said is something that I'm aware of. And uh, for the record, my book is not available on Amazon, okay. uh, it, partly for that very reason. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, it's the irony is not lost on me that Amazon started as an online bookseller. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That, uh, you know, I suppose uh, feel free to uh, to edit in the dump, dump, dump sound. <laughs> Um, but yeah, all these things are really interesting quandaries are, are interesting questions. Um, I, and, and listen to your listening audience, I'm sure we'll lighten the discussion up sometime soon, <laughs> but, um, I'm pretty convinced that within 10 years, we will literally just be able to tell the computer to tell us a story and it will come up with something absolutely unique decent, compelling, interesting, and it will sound absolutely studio pristine. Right. So we're headed to the point where we're not even creating our own entertainment anymore. Right. We are turning into, or at least being encouraged to allow ourselves to turn into mere consumers. Yeah. And at absolutely. that point, at, at that point, George Orwell, starts spinning in <laughs> his coffee can full of ashes. Oh. So you're right. And I do think that there is a part to be played by the consumers to say, I would really feel better if this was a person. Right. And, and, and make that known. Amazon's still going to try to get as much money as possible coming in with the least amount of money going out. That's just the truth. Right. But what I encourage your listeners to do is remember Amazon is not the only game in town. There are many other purveyors of audiobooks from people all over the writing spectrum. And some of the best stuff that I've heard slash read in the last couple of years certainly wasn't on the audible bestsellers list. They were niche writers who, as we were saying earlier, took the time during the pandemic to write something I'm big on. I don't like giant corporations telling me what's interesting. Sure. What I should be fascinated by or what I should feel passionate about. So I drill down into those lower tiers and I find really, really rewarding stuff. And if that's it, it that works, that works as a way to get yourself away from this. Well, here, this is what the company's serving you up. No, I'm going to go get something else. I'm going to support somebody else. It's the, you know, it's the buy local mantra of sure. Christmas. I'm a yeah. big believer in that. And frankly, I feel that that's the best tool for us as consumers of this kind of content to make sure that this kind of content stays being consumable. Yeah. And I mean, we, we sort of are hypocrites in that sense because we, use audible as our primary source of getting our audiobooks mm -hmm. mostly because it's the way we've done it for the last 15 years right you're inside that ecosystem so stepping yeah. out of it would be kind of a, a task right i mean we i just looked the other day we have over 550 titles on our our audible account mm -hmm. and we um but the thing that we also try not to do necessarily is look at those top seller lists like you're saying we right. we go through and we just find the things that we think are interesting or that we 
go ahead and give a listen and then we give a review whether it's good or not that's that's the way we go about it we don't look at what's plastered all over the front page that like you said they are trying to tell you this is the one we want you to listen to <laughs> mm -hmm. so we do try to avoid that and we have um not super seriously but definitely talked about looking into other avenues to get a hold of audiobooks and make other people aware of those things as well yeah and uh, number one, I'm grateful to hear you say that because, again, more consumers being proactive about that means that the vitality of the industry is is kept on, well, frankly, I guess, life support. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the other thing for me about it is the process of discovery for me is is something that I enjoy. And... I don't necessarily, even if I am served up something that I go, yeah, that was awesome. There's something about the, well, I'm Gen X. So, you know, I go back to the days of buying LPs because of the picture that was on the cover of them, <laughs> irrespective of the music and then going, oh, and the music's awesome. <laughs> um, that kind of, that part of discovery, I don't think is in addition to I think it's inherent in a larger appreciation of the content that you're consuming. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I do, like you, um, I, I do tend to kind of try to go in cold. Um, I, I read uh, the description, the jacket description, uh, which is an oxymoron right now because there are no <laughs> jackets anymore. So, um, But I do try to go in fresh without a preconception. And without all the, the little bait tactics of the marketers. And, you know, I say that as somebody who supports marketing, I've done, you know, over the last five years, I've done probably a hundred book trailers. Um, you probably have heard me do a book trailer because I've done <laughs> book trailers for some pretty large books, but this idea of discovery and being able to find something unique, um, yeah, you know, there's water cooler issues about being able to talk about the latest, greatest thing, but you know, I'm a nerd at heart and I don't care if people like what I'm reading or consuming. I like it. That's why I showed up. And I really still encourage people to have your passions and hold them close and let them buoy you in bad times because they're really what got us through or is getting us through. I am talking like it's over. <laughs> um, you know, a, a really, a really bad time. That's just sure. it. When, when this stuff went down, where'd you turn? You turned to art, you turned to music and you turned to personalities who were willing to put themselves out on the great old interwebs and entertain you for a while. Uh, and yeah, writers and things like that. And that's why I think I come off as being a little bit chicken little about AI and narration. Because there are so many people who are helped not only by listening to an audiobook, but by being the voice of an audiobook. I can't tell you what voiceover and voice work has done for people in their lives. People who for years might have felt that they missed their opportunity to be artistic and to have a craft and to uh, be able to express themselves in a way with their voice that maybe they wanted to be a singer, but they just can't hold a tune. I teach my students that voiceover and voice acting is musical. It's music. It's just not in the A, C, B, D, E, F, you know, all the notes on the stick. It's a much narrower bandwidth of notes. But instead of measuring changes in pitch and whole notes, we as narrators and voice actors do it in semitones sure. and being able to put color and emotion and movement into words by just barely changing the inflection in our voice. And somebody discovering that through the pandemic, I've got literally dozens of students who have said, man, if it weren't for voiceover, I'd be really lost. And I'm one of them. And thinking that those opportunities are starting to ebb away for people, people, capital P, people, <laughs> that those are starting to be taken from society and culture. That's something I'm going to fight against. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. We, yeah, we talked about this a little bit over the last couple of days that it is something that we actually started a conversation about, like you were saying, the, um, the artwork being produced by AI. Yeah. yeah. It's that's pretty kind of, freaky. Right. Well, and then the thing that's getting people on the internet in an uproar is that People are using those things like you're talking about. You punch in, you know, what you want to see. I want to see myself standing on top of a mountain holding a building over my head. They hit generate. It goes. It looks photorealistic or like somebody painted it. And then they turn around and they sell it for real money. Yeah, exactly. And real artists who are sitting at a... What, however, they do it, whether it's digitally or with paint, watercolors, markers, they're, they're having aneurysms. Yeah, they're, they're just like, like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, and they're they're saying I had to come up with all of that stuff myself from my brain, and so many of them are saying I spent years and years coming up with my own unique designs, my own unique artwork, and you spent. 30 seconds plugging it into the computer or better yet you took one of my already done pictures and you That's copied it. it and pasted it and you told mm -hmm. it to change it and now you're yep. turning around and selling it as if it's your own i well, mean and, and now we come back to this idea of consent too because one of the biggest arguments and actually of one of the other 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 things i do <laughs> is um i also do a i also do a podcast called keep your hat on and it's me and two of my friends and my old philosophy professor from college the guy who taught me to think these thinkies <laughs> and um w w our latest episode surprisingly enough is also on this topic and my business partner one of the guys on the podcast is an artist he's both a graphic designer graphic artist web developer but he's also a canvas artist and one of the big issues here is if you've digitized any of your art and it's been up on the interwebs for any period of time. Your art is now a reference point for that AI algorithm to take and use as it sees fit in the creation of something that you will get neither any remuneration for or any credit for. Right. That should make everybody concerned. But at the same time, and again, this kind of goes back to disability. There's so much help that AI can provide people. Um, and I'm big, again, you know, I, I when I had my accident, I had just started to work on learning how to play guitar. I was a vocalist until then. And I was just kind of getting the hang of things. And then I had this accident and my right hand really only works about 20% now. But I still had tons of music in my head. And I knew the first time I saw an Apple Macintosh computer back in 86 or so, I was like, that's going to be something that helps clumsy old me with one hand actually write a symphony. And I support that. But I don't necessarily support hitting button four on my stream deck and suddenly having, you know, Paco Bell's Canon as done by me but not really suddenly puke out my speakers. Right. So we're coming to this point where we, we need to have a discussion about how this impacts culture. And it, it's not like we need a consensus because there's only what 8 billion of us crawling around on the planet now, but we need to have some kind of mechanism so people can make an informed choice about the content they're consuming and how it gets created. I think that's really all I'm asking for. Right. Is the yeah. option to say no. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that, at the very least, that should have to be, you know, stated plainly, you know, as where the narrator name would be, it should say AI whatever. So Look, I know. If we've got some law that says that if your tin of spam was made in a facility that has but one peanut in it, you know, we can do this for other things. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 And I definitely agree with you that I think, I mean, I don't necessarily have a horse in the race when it comes to the artwork side of stuff. 
but I definitely understand where these artists are coming from that, you know, Hey, if you take my artwork and just cause you fed it through this AI machine and it spit out something different. However, it's all my things that you fed into <laughs> yeah. it. Shouldn't that technically be considered my artwork? I mean, I definitely understand where they're coming from. Yeah. And for me, and I keep on beating this drum with my followers and my students, you know, we've got these terms, we've got voice over and we've got voice actor and we've got voice artist. Uh, what I try to encourage people pursuing voice talents uh, and, and the voice work realm is you need to think of yourself as a capital A actor and a capital A artist. And as such, if you, well, and here's another little look behind the curtain, and I'll keep this really brief. Uh, a lot of times in online casting or online gig work sites, job sites, you'll see posts, $40 for 20 minutes of your voice. We just want you to have a conversation. And what they're saying, um, and this is very attractive to people trying to get into voice work, because they're like, look, somebody's going to pay me to say something. So they, they do these things. What you don't know is they tell you that it is for uh, voice prompt research. We're trying to get our computer to understand people's calls into a call center as handled by our answering computer. What they're not telling you is that your voice has been recorded. And when you accept money for it, you are essentially signing away the rights to the fingerprint of your voice, which is then going to be fed into an algorithm that will help make AI voices better. Right. So again, where's the line of consent? Yeah, absolutely. And I think Bo, you had sent me an article just recently too, that said that there was another AI that could basically mimic somebody's voice oh, with as yeah, little Microsoft one. Yeah. Yep. And it was as little as what? Three, three minutes seconds. No, or three, three seconds, three seconds, yeah, three seconds. I, it, I, and Bill, I know exactly the one you're referring to. I dove into it yesterday and I just clicked off my computer and said, that's enough horror for one day. I'm, I, I need to go, I don't know, play with my cat. <laughs> something. Yeah. It's just getting to a, it's like you said, it's just, exponentially expanding before and it's happening to the extent that a lot of people are not paying attention to it like you said <laughs> i think it's happening so fast it's almost impossible to right. pay attention to it that's again moore's law originally was designed for semiconductors but it was extrapolated out into a larger view of the progress of technology but even more we're running up to the point where um, within the next four or five years, Moore's law is going to be defunct. It's going to have to be redefined because we are now getting down to the, to the point where we're going to have to jump to quantum computers mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you can only get so small. You can only go down, uh, to, to uh, a certain point in miniaturization and microization to where you're running up. Uh, against things like Planck length, where it is just, you know, it, it's in, indefinably small. So we're going to hit a point where Moore's law doesn't work for physical objects anymore, but it's not going to not work for the overall measure of the acceleration of technology. And it's especially not going to work for artificial intelligence. And no, I don't think that we're all going to wind up being consumed by Skynet anytime soon. But I'm not saying that it's not going to ever happen. And so we <laughs> need to have the discussion. We recently uh, listened to the three body problem. I... Ooh, yeah. Are you, are you familiar with that? Very, yes. Uh, yeah, we're going to be reviewing that on our podcast here soon. But I'm just 
saying that all of these conversations now know, are not it's... making me feel any better about the book. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. And here I was supposed to come in and be all nice and fluffy and happy and let's no, talk no. about making funny no. voices. I, I asked you the question about it. I, I poked the bear. So <laughs> <laughs> the, you saying you poked the bear is funnier than, you know, I, I won't bother to explain it, but yeah, I, I, you know, I have real concerns. Do I think that, you know, here to, to, to wrap this part of it up, do I think people are not going to be human narrators anymore. No, I, I am confident that for the rest of my days, I will be able to use my pie hole to make sounds <laughs> that people want to hear. That's kind of where I am with it. Um, but do I think that it is going to be more and more prevalent? Absolutely. And the thing that really does concern me, uh, Ryan, as, as you were saying, is that it's the where are people paying attention? And not only that, it's happening so fast that it's hard to actually pay attention. We've got so many other lines of noise. The signal to noise ratio in modern life is not in our favor by way of comprehension. Yeah. So these things just kind of scoot past. How many of us watch Google, uh, you know, uh, uh, Google presentations at big tech conferences where they're actually explaining to the developing popul the, the developer population what Google is doing next? The answer is nobody, unless you're a dev. <laughs> so right. dev devs know what's up. Devs know what's coming because they're all making the next app, you know? And if it doesn't smell like it's going to set the world on fire, it goes unnoticed and unheralded until suddenly there's this new app and everybody just gets to put a picture in and it spits out this incredible image and all your warts are removed and you know you were able to erase your cousin and and they're like wow this is fantastic where did this come from oh 6 years ago they right. started developing a new yeah. algorithm so yeah we i do encourage people to pay a little bit more attention that doesn't mean that any of us can hop on the driver's side and slam on the brake but at least we'll have an idea of where we're going yeah yeah and i think that is important i just because you said that about new apps and phones i always see them google pixel phone commercials and then it shows that anybody can now you snap a picture and then you can just scribble over and erase people around you and i thought that's probably not good if right now everybody has the capability of doing that right at their fingertips it really creates this kind of weird like, you know, oh, you say that that person wasn't there, you know, during this crime that you snapped a picture of. Well, no, look at my phone because you already erased them out of it. So, yeah. <laughs> like, it just it creates this weird dynamic. Mm -hmm. And it's it's one of those things where we are now to the point where, you know, I I I I feel bad for the people in forensic science because, the, as you just described we even have questions about whether or not a thing that was once extant really ever was. If you have the ability to properly erase your digital footprint and properly erase some visible evidence of something happening at that point, you're manufacturing your own reality. Right. And woe be unto you in a court of law. If you have to prove otherwise, yeah, especially when now you, you know, if you happen to have this phone, they could say, well, how do we know this is not doctored? And well, we got to dig deeper. I and mean, the, and now you've got to go and say, oh, yeah, because you thought you had privacy, but Google actually kept right. all the evidence. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's, can we talk about puppies now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, this usually happens uh, a lot of the times on the podcast. If Bo and I don't have necessarily a book lined up or we just want to take a break for a week, we just sit and have a conversation and usually and inevitably divulge, you <laughs> know, devolves into stuff like this. Yeah. yeah. No, by the I, end, we just got to take a break. I'm happy to talk about this uh, and to be talking about this and to be a voice talking about this simply because I've always been the kind of guy where if I was going to get hit by a car, I want to see it coming. Right. <laughs> I want, I, you know, that's, that's how I look at it. Yeah. No. And I think 
we also think that that's important um, going forward. And like I said, and maybe we'll talk with you a little bit after this too, for different avenues to get your, you know, audiobooks and things like that from, especially if this is something you don't want to support to give people options for places to, to support narrators and still the idea of actual voiceover work. Absolutely. And there are options. Um, but Unfortunately, due to successful marketing, you got to spend some time looking for them. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing you unfortunately run into is, you know, the Audible app is very easy to use. It's intuitive. It's simple. I hit buy now and boom, it's there. It's ready like to download. anything else that's got Amazon's brand on it, it is ultimately effortless to use. Right. And, and that's the hook. Yeah. And like it or not that you know sometimes you look at these other avenues of places to get these books yeah and you got to download mp3s and you got to have a particular player or it's got to right. be encoded different yeah so you're absolutely right in that a barrier to entry might as well be a locked door yeah especially these days yeah mm -hmm. i mean because when uh, Brandon Sanderson had made his comment about not releasing his newest book on Audible, I thought, oh, well, I wonder where he's doing it. And he had mentioned um, Spotify, which, like it or not, is also a large corporation. So Yeah, you're, you're switching <laughs> one evil horse for the other evil horse. But right. an option is an option. And, and yeah. bar barring going to somebody's website and downloading MP3 files. At some point, you kind of got to go, well, okay, I guess this is the lesser of two evils day. Sure. You know? Yeah, and it is unfortunate. And then another one of the ones he had mentioned, I was kind of thrown for a loop because it was actually, honestly, I believe it was like a text-to-speech uh, program, right, <laughs> basically. Right. Yeah. And I thought, well, wait a second. So it sounded like he was basically going to you know, sell them probably the rights to the book to be able to be used in this text-to-speech program. And here we are back with AI synthesized exactly. voices. I was going to say, yep, yeah. and now we've come yeah. full circle. <laughs> the irony is not lost on right. me, no. And, you know, guys, at the end of the day, I generally am the, the loudest advocate for the artist. And that artist can be the voice artist, it can be the author, it can be the content creator on YouTube. Um, I believe in supporting people because the one thing, and uh, again, whether or not this holds true a week from now, you know, give me a call. Um, the, the one thing that we still have dominance over is the creative process and having ideas and bringing those ideas into existence so that other people can share in that experience. Um, and, you know, now we're getting very Philip K. Dickian, do Android's dream of electric sheep kind of thing. <laughs> um, but that's because it's time to start taking that into consideration. Right. And, and putting your head in the sand about it is going to do no one any good. The only thing that putting your head in the sand is going to guarantee uh, is that when that car does come to hit you, it hits you in the back end and drives you deeper down into the dirt. Sure. I want to have all these options on the table at all time because one of the things that modern life does allow for is an embarrassment of choice. Sure. I just don't want corporations telling everybody this is the way you get this now. I mean, yeah. broadcast television tried that. And look what happened now. I haven't had a satellite or a cable coming to my house in over five years because I cut the cord, because I didn't want to be force-fed what the large media companies told me was interesting. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I successfully evaded Tiger King all throughout the <laughs> pandemic, and I still hold that, I still wear that as a badge of honor. <laughs> um, but the simple choice and the knowledge that this is happening is what's going to be the knowledge of it happening is what's going to be empowering for people both as consumers and as content creators and i do a lot of work on youtube and by the way here's a free one one of the places where you can go get some incredible audiobooks is youtube 
Sure. I mean, and again, here we are in another ginormous corporation ecosystem, but um, I've listened to so many fascinating things on YouTube that were audiobooks. And I mean, some of them go all the way back to the day where somebody repurposed some books on tape thing, um, which is a, a fond memory from my youth, understanding that, wait, somebody sits in a room and reads a book into a tape recorder? Um, <laughs> well, that's but, how we, uh, that's yeah, where we got our first that's books. Our humble beginnings. That, yeah. That's where everybody's humble beginnings <laughs> are, man, because that's how it started. And there actually are recitations of books on wax cylinders. Wow. That's how long quote unquote books on tape have been because you know what there've been blind people for a really long time sure <laughs> turns out you know and and they needed a hand uh but uh going to youtube finding there are a lot of independent narrators who have presences on youtube and read things a lot of them yeah, a lot of it's in the public domain so they don't get copyright strike but they're great performers and being able to support them give them a like click and subscribe as we bang on and on on youtube <laughs> support sure. them that way support independent authors who have gone the route of not wanting to be on audible because they wind up getting pennies for their work so they set up a youtube channel i i worked with an author who's got like i think like 11 books now i mean we're like we're talking george rr R. martin thick kind of stories right um and that's how he makes his living is by people subscribing to his YouTube channel. And he's got millions and millions of views that actually generates a reasonable amount of money. So being a follower of somebody or something like that actually kind of gets you closer to the good old days of finding an author that you really liked and supporting them by buying their books. They're not selling you their books anymore. What they're doing is asking you to follow them so that Google pays them the sure. money. That sounds like a pretty decent trade-off. Yeah. We've actually, uh, I think we've only done one, but I was just perusing Reddit and I found a guy who had, he was talking about a production he had done and it was an HP Lovecraft story that him and a few buddies of his did a full-blown production of multiple yep. voices, sound effects, all of this stuff. And it was only about 15 minutes long. But my God, it was one of the better full-blown productions we had ever heard. And it was just yeah. from a random Reddit post on a random YouTube channel, pretty much. And I'm one of the moderators of, of the randomness on Reddit. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and yeah, that kind of stuff happens all the time. I actually just finished with two other moderators of Reddit. Uh, we did a, uh, a radio play treatment of a story made famous uh, uh, as a radio play called three skeleton key and uh have it up on youtube i'll provide a link for it there because it is one of those where i do sound design and foley and all that other stuff and um uh we we did it pretty much just as a practice exercise but it it's a great listen i've had people tell me this was fantastic i listened to it in headphones and it felt like it was there i could hear the 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 creatures i'm not i won't spoil it um but you know all, all the being able to support those content creators. Uh, you know, the, the pandemic, to mention it for the 78th time in this in interview, um, it really turned me on to YouTube in a way that I was really just a casual user before. I, like anybody else, if I locked myself out of my truck and needed to know how to break into my own truck, <laughs> you go to YouTube, right? right? And I'm not exaggerating. Yeah, I learned how to break into my Ford Ranger with my <laughs> own aerial, with my own antenna from YouTube. And I had to do it more than once. <laughs> um, but what it, what it really woke up in me is this idea that, yeah, okay, we've got a bunch of scary AI stuff going on right now. But this is a golden age for content creation. Right. We are not dependent upon the big studios anymore. We don't fall for advertising saying that you need to watch desperate American housewives. We can choose what we want. We can follow people that we want who are producing great content independently with nothing but a cell phone and a microphone that they got off of the giant corporation website. But, <laughs> um, you know, I got to give them props. They, they kept me in business. I can't argue sure. that, but 
you know, people I'll rattle off names of people that I follow, people like Adam Savage, who used to be on Mythbusters, but now runs Tested. Yeah. Uh, and, and or Mark Rober, um, uh, Destin from Smarter Every Day. Uh, all these people are putting up, I mean, it's not just little five minute pieces. You know, I mean, you can literally walk around the, the National Air and Space Museum with Adam Savage and an astronaut talking about what they're looking at and getting <laughs> behind the scenes look. Or one of my favorites is a guy named Eric at Hand Tool Rescue, where he just gets these really old, gnarly, rusted up things like a gas powered bone saw or something like that and restores it to absolute working condition. I never saw Bob Vila do that on PBS. Right. <laughs> and so you have this ability to support the creator of the media and they, you are, you are so much closer to being able to be in contact with them than you would be, uh, I don't know, say some large person on television or like one of the guys on, uh, you know, from antique archeology, span uh, uh, or God forbid the history channel and the ancient aliens guys. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's that immediacy of the content and the creative process that we've never experienced in in our modern culture people of all stripes and i'll include this in the voiceover industry as well people of all stripes can start doing this and make this content and you are not bound by what a corporation tells you is interesting you can go out find it yourself and support it directly support it through things like patreon or buy me a coffee or kofi or you know buying something off of Etsy. That's a revolution. And it's a revolution that's been a long time coming and is one that I support as both a content creator myself, a narrator and a consumer. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it is much better that you can now directly, you know, support the content that you like to consume the again it just is unfortunate where we're getting to where now the corporations are like whoa, whoa wait a minute <clears throat> they're trying to get away from us yeah no 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 here let's muddy the waters now with this ai thing you know it's just mm -hmm. it, it is going to be a a battle obviously but definitely i mean if there's got to be a hill to die on it it can't be the worst one to die on as far as i'm concerned well, just so long as it's not the opening scene of uh, Terminator 2 Judgment Day where the hill is nothing but the skulls of the fallen being <laughs> crushed by chrome feet. I, I say that because I just included that snippet in my latest video. So sure. uh, yeah. anyway, stick with the theme. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, so like, what what is like one thing you would say to somebody who is like an aspiring voice actor and they know that they can deal with all this rejection Mm. What is like, what is one thing that you would tell them to kind of like, to send them on their way? Find a community, find a community of people who are doing what you want to do and hang with them. Uh, you know, so many of us who do voice work independently, uh, we had to stumble through the minefields ourselves. Uh, you know, and I mean, I say that I started full time back in about 2015. So I've been doing it now about, about nine, eight, nine years. Um, I would have made a lot more progress, a lot more quickly if I had more people that I could have had personal interactions with. Um, you know, I followed a bunch of content creators that were on YouTube at the time, um, and, uh, made acquaintances and friends with some of them. And actually, uh, my audiobook, um, one of the, one of the big voices, voices, I guess, uh, one of the big presences on YouTube by way of voiceover work is a guy named Mike Delgadio who goes by the handle Booth Junkie. And Mike and I actually started our, our home voice work at about the same time. We're kind of contemporary with each other. But Mike is much bigger on YouTube than I am. And he was kind enough when I wrote my book. I sent him my book and uh, said, would you be willing to, to write a foreword for it? And he's like, oh, yeah, no problem. And I was like, okay, this is great. How much do you want to record it uh, for my audiobook version? And the next email I had, literally five minutes later, was him saying here with a file attached to it. And he recorded the, 
the the forward of my audiobook. But he and I both run servers on Discord. And by the way, I love Discord. Man, if you want community and you're like me, you're you're of a certain age by way of your geekdom, uh, Discord is like the good old days of bulletin boards uh, in all the best ways. And I run a uh, a server for my boot camp crowd who follow me on YouTube. And he runs a server and being able to be with people doing what I do or are trying to um, and be able to ask questions and not have to wait for days for an email answer, maybe um, it, it, it accelerates the process so much. It allows you to avoid so many pitfalls. It saves you money. Um, you know, the old joke about buying a boat is a boat is just a hole in the water that you throw money into. <laughs> uh, vo voice work is easily the boat version of audio recording because you, if you're beginning, you think, oh, well, a better mic or a better recording computer or this, that, or the other technological thing is going to save you. It's not. And being able to ask somebody who's just a few steps further down the path than you are. Here's my, here's my use case. Here's my issue. What's the best way? Even if they can't tell you what the best way is, they'll tell you the mistakes they made that you can avoid. And the other thing that community really does to reach back to when we were talking about the incredibly high rejection rate in voice work, being able to be with a bunch of people who go, yeah, yeah, that's a thing. And that happens and <laughs> right. that, that still happens to me. And I've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, that rising tide floating all boats mentality, the, the tribe mentality, the tribe of voice actors and voice artists is very beneficial. And I really encourage people, uh, if you are interested, find a group of people that do what you're, what you want to do and hang with them because you know, no carpenter ever became a proficient carpenter by hanging out with plumbers. Sure. Hang with the people that you want to be like. Yeah. And, um, you know, the other things, again, it's easier to, it's easier to start doing this work. I didn't say get into this business. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a difference. It's easier to start doing this work than you might think. And honestly, the quality of your microphone give or take. I mean, there are, there's plenty of garbage out there, but you do not need to spend upwards of a thousand dollars on a microphone. The microphone I'm talking to you guys on right now costs 250 bucks. And that's in today's money. When I first bought it, I got it on sale for 160. Nice. Um, and I'm going through a very simple audio unit. This didn't cost me 150 bucks. You could do what I did, which is literally grab a bunch of disused and some would say of questionable uh uh, uh cleanliness uh old mattress <laughs> toppers tack them to your wall go out and get yourself a used uh usb microphone and start doing it the microphone is way down on the list what's really at the top of the list is practice and training and it's something that doesn't get talked about enough everybody thinks that because they have a voice they can be a voice actor no, what you can be is a noise. Huh. And I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm saying that there's much more skill and artistry here. And yeah, some people are naturals. Okay. Some people are, you know, they're born with that ham bone and they love performing. That's great. And that gives you a leg up without question. But then you need to learn all the other things that this industry necessitates like marketing and business. And oh yeah, did you pay your taxes? You probably want to, um, you know, an incorporation and how to find work and how to find an agent. And so even talented people can really benefit from hanging with a group of people who've done this before, because you're going to learn something. And if it's free, even better. But having said the free word, one of the things that makes, that gives people the greatest advantage and the highest and the highest return on investment is coaching is finding a voice coach because again to use uh, an example that uh, another practitioner of mine on one of my uh, podcasts 
uh, Paul Schmidt of Voice Talent said, you can have a Stradivarius, but if you've never played the violin before, it's going to sound like cats fighting. <laughs> so you can get a lot back from paying a good voice coach. And most good voice coaches, they'll do either a free session with you to give you a feel for what it's going to be like, or they'll do a reduced rate for the first few, or, um, you know, you don't have to pay a lot either. A lot of times, uh, a beginning voice talent will pay $200 an hour for some very high positioned VO coach. And that VO coach is not going to give you value for dollar because they're used to working with professional talents and they don't want to spend time with you holding your hand, find somebody willing to hold your hand, find somebody willing to work with new talent and start there. Because yeah, you might pay them 50, 60 bucks an hour, but if they get you to not spend thousands of dollars before you're ready, th then that's valuable to you. And so I say practice and coaching first, getting a deadened room environment, which can be done. The sometimes the hardest thing you got to do is either order mattress toppers or go down to a, a, a consignment store, a Salvation Army or something like that and buy a bunch of old blankets and tack them up in your closet and then a microphone. Because to be honest, a well-treated space can make a very cheap microphone sound a lot better than you think it does. And so the order of operation is really useful, but it all again, comes back around to find a community, come hang out with us on Reddit. You can either do it there or find a group of practitioners on someplace like discord or Facebook or anything like that, because they're going to give you the information that you would spend 10 times the length of time trying to find on your own. They've already got it. So get it from them. It's going to speed the plow guaranteed. Yeah, I think that's all great information too, especially for somebody wanting to get started. And I think a lot of what you're saying too, you cover pretty detailed, right? On your on your YouTube channel, your boot oh yeah, camp, you yeah, both both on boot camp and in my book, the Quick and Dirty Guide to the Home Voiceover Industry. That's why I wrote it. Right. I didn't write it to become famous, and God knows I didn't write it to make money because it certainly <laughs> hasn't. But it's really a condensation of my experiences and my knowledge gained in the independent voiceover realm for the last eight or so years. And, you know, I did voice work all the way back into the 80s. But really what got me moving forward was, again, finding the right people to listen to and taking a page from them. And, yeah, it works. It just works. Yeah, I think that's all really good information, especially with how much information you can have at your fingertips these days, you know, right? Like, yeah, Reddit is a an immense community, you just have to find the right place where you're looking for the information. And be mindful of the signal to noise ratio. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. because the you know, Reddit is great. I'm pleased and proud to be uh, both a member and a moderator of a uh, voiceover uh, thread on Reddit, a uh, subreddit there. But, you know, even I go, the signal to noise ratio gets pretty out of whack. Yeah. And so finding a group of people numbered in the hundreds, not the tens of thousands, might serve you better. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, I mean, we, and we're always looking for it. That's one reason we kind of got started in this, too, is that we, we both knew, obviously, that we liked listening to audiobooks and stuff, but we... We thought, you know, there's all these people who review books all the time, which is great because obviously the books and the stories are great. But we've definitely said that there are books that if I was reading it myself after about 10 pages, I would have put it down and said, that's enough. I'm, I'm done with this. Yeah, but, but the, because, narr yeah, the narrator yeah, kept you there. Yes, mm -hmm. the narrator is what <clears throat> kept me there. And so we thought that that was kind of an important little not necessarily a niche, but that was important for us too, is that while yes, the story may be good or bad, the narrator can also make that good or bad. And we thought that was an important thing to yeah. kind of bring to the surface. Or gooder -er or batterer. -er. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think you're absolutely right. And I think you guys are doing a fantastic job of bringing this to the surface because again, so much of this 
by way of us as consumers, so much of this is invisible. And I personally feel that knowing that, you know, getting to look behind that curtain and understand there's an industry here and it, there's a, a, an artistic pursuit here and there's mastery here and virtuosity here to experience and knowing all that stuff is going into your product that you're listening to. I personally feel that that just makes it richer. It just makes it be more interesting top to bottom. For sure. Yeah. And we, again, <clears throat> we greatly appreciate you coming on here and, and talking with us about this stuff, because again, we don't, I mean, I don't know anyone in the industry necessarily that I could have reached out to and said, Hey, give me your opinions on this. So, well, I'm you, you really do now. Grateful. Yeah. You do well, now. Yeah. And it, and it's awesome that we have that, that avenue and we really appreciate it. And again, that's how I found you is on the internet through Reddit. Right? So, I mean, yeah. yeah. So yeah. hats off to Reddit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank sure. you, Snoo. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Bo, you got anything else before we, uh, we let Andrew go? No, I just thank you, Andrew. It's been truly a pleasure just to listen to you, honestly. Well, that's kind of what they pay me for. Yeah, <laughs> I can see why. But I, I could have done different voices if you wanted the guy that was selling you pastrami. I got that guy in my pocket. I can always bring that one out. Um, no, guys, it's been a treat. And uh, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to bring this up as a point of discussion because it's going to be affecting all of us very soon, if not already. And... Uh, you know, I don't think that I don't want people to fear, but I want people to be aware. And if I can be a voice of awareness in this, all's the better. And I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to do so. Plus, it's just it's been a blast. You guys uh, do a really good job. And I know for one, I'm going to be subscribing to your podcast. So you, you're getting at least <laughs> one more sub out of this. And that's the goal, Ooh, as we all know. Right. Hey. Hey, 11, I remember when I crested 11 a couple times, it <laughs> felt like quite an achievement. Yeah, we always joke about that because we, to us, it's not necessarily even the listener count. I mean, yeah, it's important, but these are conversations Bo and I were going to have mostly anyway, so we just decided right. one day to record them. Um, but it, we always joke about that too. We're like, so for the three of you out there listening, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My uh, one of my podcasts uh, starts, and thank you to all our non-existent viewers around <laughs> the world. So, no, thank you guys very much. I've really had a blast. Yeah, and we we definitely appreciate having you on. And um, yeah, again, remind everybody where they can find you if they want to go directly find you. Where all they can do that. Well, considering that I have seventy-two email addresses, I will. Um, <laughs> I will uh, narrow this down. You can find me directly on YouTube at at the VO Bootcamp, or just do a search for Andrew Scott. Uh, be aware, you will run into the uh, the actor, the sexy priest from <laughs> Fleabag. Uh, he got my name first. <laughs> um, but, uh, you can also go to, uh, the website, andrewscottmedia.com. That would be for businessy type stuff or hiring me as a narrator or producer, or you can just go to, uh, www.vobooth.camp. I'm one of the people that has a dot camp address. That was super convenient. Wow. Um, and, uh, you can, uh, follow me on, YouTube, you can follow me on uh, over to uh, my Discord server, which is uh, if you just search VO Bootcamp, you will find our server. Or again, I'm sure if you look uh, down into the show notes here of this here podcast, uh, you will find a bunch of relevant links as well. But if anybody's got any direct questions that they'd like me to ask or answer, they can always just email me directly at andrew at andrewscottmedia.com. Right on. Yeah, and we really appreciate everybody for listening. And with that, we will catch you guys in the next one.